You can tell by the trees it is fall and it is beautiful in western New York. It's time for another edition of Community. You feeling autumnal? Because I am. Looks beautiful out here. We're in the heart <coughs> of the Broadway Fillmore neighborhood at the Central Terminal talking about new beginnings. Welcome to Community, I'm Claudine Ewing. And I'm Pete Gallivan, and we are gonna be talking about the Central Terminal, and because it's something we've been talking about mm -hmm. for decades, about what, what should happen, but finally something is happening. James sure. Burrell's here to talk about how this community has come together, because I think a lot of people for the longest time said, okay, what should we put into the community, rather than asking the community what it was. What a great day. What a great day in fall to be here in Buffalo and at the Central Terminal because this is a new beginning of what's going to happen, not just for the east side, but the Broadway Fillmore area. We're ready to redevelop this great building. Can you talk a little bit more about what you all plan to do with it? Because as you know, you said you grew up not far away from here sure. and there have been plans after mm -hmm. plans development this is going to happen right now we're in the RFP process which is going to take maybe six to eight months to fulfill and at that point we'll hire a consultant we'll hire developers and we'll be off and running to reactivate mm. the central terminal foundry brought over right. all these uh, these these great benches and things that's what right. it's all about coming together right sure so this collaboration with the foundry and the making and manufacturing program they have. What a great program yeah. for individuals to put something on paper, develop it, build it, and bring it now. This is something that's going to activate this great lawn. It's gonna be welcoming. It's gonna be bringing individuals from the community to be able to come here and have lunch, bring their families, and it's just gonna be great for the community. But what it, what it does is, this is something that the community wanted and it's something that we did. What we wanna do is reactivate that with the great public spaces here at the, um, the Great Lawn, to the lunchroom that's being developed, to the arches around the, the, um, the, the windows that's in the concourse there, and the structure. Steve Stout is the second lay president at Canisius College, succeeding John Hurley. Catholic higher education has been so important to me and in my life and in my profession. Um, and although this is my first experience as a Jes at a Jesuit college, um, the values were very appealing to me. I sat down with Stout to talk about his vision. Why Buffalo? And what I've heard is about this re renaissance in the city, um, and I wanted to be part of that. I wanted Canisius to be a more active leader in helping the city. He wants all students to succeed. The students now are not the students of the 90s, <laughs> definitely not of the 60s and 70s. That's right. And that's why we probably have lay presidents now. And that's exactly what you said. Our students now are different. Um, they come to us having lived experiences. So it's not a clean slate. They don't come to us as clean slates. They come to us having lived experiences. How do we understand those in context and help them find their purpose in life? And that requires us to think differently about the education that we offer and how we do it. Stout's resume includes time at Princeton and DePaul. Here's a blast from the past. When he immigrated to the U.S. from Trinidad and Tobago in 2000, he was a soccer player at Seton Hall. When I think about my stamp on this institution and this community, it is embracing opportunity by dismantling obstacles. I am convinced that this generation of young people will change the world. Yeah. And we have to help them do that. Not stand in their way, not erect barriers and obstacles. We have to support them in doing that. And Jesuit values are, are important. Steve Stout is the first black president at Canisius and the youngest. His sister introduced him at the inauguration. In a world that is ever changing, I believe that you, Canisius College, have chosen the best leader because his adaptability is unquestionable and his passion for education is boundless. I am beyond proud and equally as excited to see what the team here achieves throughout his presidency. With that, please welcome President Steve K. Stout. We will inspire a new generation of leaders 
who will not accept the status quo, who will challenge any and all systems of inequity, who will change the very world we leave to our children and their children. We will serve every person we encounter. Canisius College will be a force for justice in our city, in our region, in our state, in our country, and in this world. And we, this Canisius family, invite any and all willing collaborators to join with us so that together we can rise to meet this moment. Earlier this month, the Buffalo Sabres announced their leadership team for the season. Rasmus Dahlin and Zemgis Gergensens appointed assistant captains, and Kyle Oposo got the C on his jersey. Because of the way he handles himself, the players say that's, that's someone I want to follow. He deserves it. He's earned it. He uh, re has represented us so well in so many so many areas beyond what you can you can see. You know, behind the scenes, he's, he's amazing. He's incredible. Desi knows the significance of being the team's first captain of color. He recalled the leadership he saw when he first turned pro in a player from another team, a player he always looked up to. Jerome Aginla is half Nigerian like myself, and he was an idol of mine for sure. And when I first was in Bridgeport, he, uh, he called me, and we spoke for about you know, 15 minutes and he just welcomed me into the league and then, you know, so that moment um, was very special to me and that's kind of the first thing that popped in my head was that, you know, he, he wore the captaincy for, he wore the, he wore the seat for Calgary for a number of years. So he knows that along with providing guidance and leadership to the younger players on the Sabres, he is also providing inspiration and an example to the next generation of players of all colors. Definitely a tremendous honor and, and something that, um, you know, with everything that's going on in the world, uh, I don't take lightly. The 1958 UB football team made history by taking a stand against racism. The team's star running back was Willie Evans. He died a few years ago, but his name now has a permanent mark on the UB campus. The Porter Quad in the Ellicott Complex is now named the Willie R. Evans Quad. I couldn't be prouder. It, this is uh, in, it's, incre it's incredible. Uh, I was shocked and surprised uh, when I heard about this, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's surreal. It's surreal. I know the culmination of any season is going to a bowl game. The excitement to put on the pads one more time and play in a bowl game. And up here in Buffalo, when you have that opportunity to go down to Florida to play a bowl game, why not? Why, why not? In December, of course, you want to go down there. But, you know, what happened, as you all know the story, is, you know, what Tangerine Bowl told, you know, administration here at Buffalo, coaches at Buffalo, hey, you guys can come. You can, you can play in the game. But those two, Willie Evans, Mike Wilson, they can't play. They can't play. You're talking about being before the times. You talk about the term brotherhood, you know, for a group of young men at the time to say, hey, if our two brothers can't play, we're not going. We're not going to play in the game. That game doesn't mean anything to us. He was a hell of a player, a player's gentleman, intelligent, a wonderful teammate, loyal to the team, and proud of UB. Humble when we decided to go, not to go to the Tangerine Bowl in their stance against, you know, that discriminatory action, Evans and his entire team really created history and became role models for us future Bulls. Billy not only exemplified our university mission, he left us, he left our UB community with an impactful legacy of service and provided us with a model for a meaningful life. He believed that you have to put 100% of yourself in everything and anything you do. If you don't, it's a waste of your time, your energy, your talent, and a lot of brain cells, too. Are you going to succeed? Not always, but you learn from what you've 
weren't able to do. He was always moving forward, and obviously the lessons he learned from that, he passed on to us, but he didn't live in the past. He, he, he was very much living in the present. Evans worked for the Buffalo Public Schools, but remained connected to UB. Students should know who Willie was and how he lived the UB mission. Coming up on Community, meet the man behind the Harriet Tubman mural in Buffalo. Well, it's October and in fall and October particular, many great things happen. The leaves change, mm -hmm. my birthday is, is in October. He's so special, <laughs> isn't he? But there's something else special about the month of October. It is a month of many things, yeah. especially when it comes to breast cancer, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. There are a lot of events taking place and we had a chance to tap into a couple of them. This is the More Than Pink Walk. Let's go! Teams with different names. My mother passed away of breast cancer in 2003. Since then, my mother, my mother-in-law is a survivor and many friends and family have been touched by breast cancer. Instead of a mile and a half walk, they're doing a 5K. We as women know how important our moms are to us and we as moms want to be there for our kids. So anything I can do to be there for my bestie is what I want to do. 17 years at this walk, that's Kareen Leone. It's inspiring, it's empowering, and I, it's just helping other people makes, makes my life complete. And the tears. Helping other people, knowing what it was like when I was diagnosed, that I was scared and others should celebrate the blessing of being um, cured. Flight attendant Ebony Thomas diagnosed with breast cancer over the summer at age 41. Surround yourself around positive people. That definitely makes a difference. Keep your mind open. Listen to your doctors, but also listen to yourself. It's chemo now, surgery later. I get tired sometimes, but I'm not like, I'm not sad. I'm like, I'm literally at peace. Like, I'm, I know I'm going to be fine. She's Her mom a is a breast cancer like survivor. I'm a 12-year survivor, and I know that she can get through this. We can get through it together. We're doing this together. So she just has to stay strong. Being told you have breast cancer changes your world. For one local woman, she used her diagnosis as an inspiration. You may have heard of the Sadie Strong Project. The woman behind it was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2017. She remained positive and now she's leading an organization to support women. We started Sadie Strong one year and on the one year anniversary of my diagnosis in 2018. And so in 2019, we held our first annual Sadie Strong event and we have been growing and growing ever since. We want to tell people that health is wealth and we want pay people to take control of their health. We want women to get their annual mammograms and we want them to live healthier lifestyles. A healthy woman creates a healthy family. They caught my cancer early and if women are taking care of themselves, they can alleviate risks. If they're getting annual mammograms and doing monthly self breast checks, it can help, you know, because one in eight women will be diagnosed in their lifetime. We want to find out early so that we can get treatment. This is my community, east side of Buffalo is where I grew up. So I want to make sure that we are providing services to people in our community that have been going through so much for the past year. Buffalo has many murals, each tells a story. There are some that stand out, like this one of Harriet Tubman. An abolitionist, she helped lead many to freedom using safe houses along the Underground Railroad, which had stops here in Buffalo. On that path is now a mural of the woman many called Black Moses. Meet the man behind the mural, Gino Morrow. Such a large canvas to work on, you know, the, the expressway, the overpass, the wall. And so I really spend a lot of time just meditating on the pure size of it. But the things that you could not anticipate is, okay, how would I respond to being 14 feet up uh, and <laughs> on a scaffold on unlevel, on unlevel ground? Then the spiders, oh my goodness, there's a f spider infestation going on. The actual subject matter of Harriet and Child was inspired by a, a sculptor by the name of Wesley Wolford. My focus for the for the concept was this sort of juxtaposition 
or duality and this constant contrast taking place. And so what you see in the eyes of the child versus what you see in Harriet's eyes is you have a child who is definitely in fear, but um, trusting because of course, as a child, you, you trust the adult that you're with. And then you have Harriet who is experienced and full of determination. You contrast that against the background where you have a very dark past um, that's represented in the form of a storm in the background versus the bright future, which is represented by the uh, butterfly and the flower in the foreground. To use his skill and tell the story in art about Harriet, her eyes. You can look into her eyes and you can see the determination. You can see her face and the intensity and the focus. And, um, and so I think what I wanted people to walk away from is the fact that um, having that degree of determination and focus uh, creates the outcomes that you desire. The lightning bolt. The lightning bolt itself is, uh, first it does represent the crack of the whip because the sound of thunder is, um, is in, in the crack of the whip are very similar. Freedom. The monarch butterfly is the intuitive desire to, uh, to be free or move about naturally. And so the monarch, of course, has a path from north to south and back north again when it migrates and, um, and reproduces. If you were to take a map of the United States and lay it directly behind the thunderbolt or the lightning bolt, it is actually the path of the Underground Railroad from the south on through to Canada. So I actually pulled that symbology off of a map and tied it in as a, uh, as a source of nature in, in the form of a lightning bolt. And the fact that this mural is right here where you are on the United States. And there's Canada. Exactly. How does it make you feel to do this in your hometown? I'm honored. Your name is now forever etched on that roadway. I'm, I'm putting my soul into this because I feel a connection to it. Morrow now lives in Dallas with his family. And he takes time to follow the saying, each one, teach one. If I wanted to inspire the next generation of people who wants, who learns about this story, I don't want to inspire them from images that make them feel like, yeah, chains, whips. You know, that's not inspiring to me. I, I, and I love my history and I know my history well. And I think that that's a relevant part. I have to teach my children that, but I have to also teach them about how to continue to hope. Hope, Harriet. Because he's learned to hope with opportunity, he's leaving a mark on the path of freedom. Coming up on Community, you know that boat that's sitting in the Buffalo River? There's a new movie about it, and we're gonna tell you about that, and also, catch up with a Motown legend. Hi, this is Martha Reeves. Join us on Community with Claudine and Pete. Give a listen, have a good time. I want to tell you a story. You might say it's a Detroit fairy tale starring the oldest. Remember that boat that you talked about on the Buffalo River? Yeah, the SS Columbia. Mm -hmm. Well, They've come out with a new movie about that and her sister ship, and you'll never guess who the voice is. Who? The voice of Columbia is Martha Reeves. Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. Yeah, at the premiere in Detroit, I had the chance to watch the movie wow. and sit down with Martha. For generations of Western New Yorkers, the Canadiana and her sister ship, the Americana, were the magical transports to a faraway land of fun called Crystal Beach. Well, Detroit had its own version of that, Boblo Island and the Boblo Boats, one of which has been undergoing restoration here on the Buffalo River at Silo City. Meanwhile, she's also the star of a new film released last week in the Motor City. We decided to write the narration from the perspective of Columbia, the Boblo Boat herself. Filmmaker Aaron Schillinger wanted to capture the emotions still attached to the park, happy memories, along with the enduring sadness of its closing 30 years ago. He also wanted to capture the childhood magic of Boblo Island, along with her twin boats, the Columbia and the St. Clair. And yes, I do have a sister. Having a magical narrator Claire. could bring people, transport them back in time and to another place. And to do that, he called in a magical voice. I thought I should praise the Lord at all. That of Motown legend, Martha Reeves. We performed on the Boblo boats. But she not only performed with her backup singers, the Vandellas, she too has great childhood memories of Boblo, just as we Buffalonians have of Crystal Beach. 
But the Bablo boat was a special thing. It was almost like going on holiday, but you didn't have to go far and you didn't have to spend the night. It's extremely relevant to people in Buffalo, and I, I feel like they'd really the story would really resonate with them. It's not only a place you went, it was part of your childhood. Exactly. Part, part of you growing up. And it was also a way to unite with other races. But it wasn't always a haven for all races. In 1945, a young woman named Sarah Elizabeth Ray was thrown off the boat because of the color of her skin. She and the NAACP took the case all the way to the highest court, represented by none other than Thurgood Marshall, and she won. There's a major Supreme Court case that is an international case in scope that happened, originated in the city of Detroit, fighting for racial equality on the Bablo boat. Her story, along with the restoration efforts at her home, are part of the film and members of her family were part of the audience. It's just, I don't know if I have the words for it just yet. I mean, uh, this is all of a sudden for all of us. Uh, the limelight, the notoriety, the recognition, uh, we're all just kind of taking it all in right now. I still remember so many things about Bablo. Stephen's brother-in-law owns the Columbia's twin, the St. Clair, and Stephen is now the ship's restoration manager. You know, the dance floor and the game room and the freedom that you had as a kid on the boat but you didn't have anywhere else. And after many stops and starts, including a devastating fire in 2018, he says they're now seeing light at the end of the tunnel. When you're working on it, what feeling do you get? Honestly, the, the first word that comes to my mind would be blessed. He says that repowering the ship is still way off in the future, but he feels if they can get a permanent dock site, he may be able to open it as a floating museum in the next year or so. I think there are more than a few Buffalonians who are sitting at home right now going, God, I wish I had a guy like that that would have saved the Canadiana. Do you feel oh, the weight of a city yeah. and the pressure of a right, city yeah, saving gone? the yeah. St. Clair? Yeah, Um. you know what? I do. It's just one of many plot lines in the film, a film that is bringing back so many memories. I remember how the boat felt moving up and down on the waves. So many emotions. I became 10 years old again. And bringing people back to a simpler time. And it was the beginning of a wonderful adventure of a lifetime that I started on the Bablo boats. And this all brought it back? Oh, yeah. I'm just trying to use um, all my anger and passion into fighting um, social justice issues in the community into something positive. So I teamed up with Friends of the Ninth People, uh, along with help from the African Heritage Food Co-op, and oh, also can't forget Main Events Banquet Hall. So they're going to supply me with um, 500 hot meals. Uh, African Heritage Food Co-op, they're going to supply us with close to 100, 150 produce bags, and we're going to distribute uh, half of all the supplies over at the Friends of the Night people. Although I wasn't a big holiday person uh, growing up, uh, my mother, she definitely was, and Thanksgiving, of course, was one of her favorite holidays. If you would like to donate any non-perishables, clothing, socks, underwear, you're more than welcome to go to um, Friends of the Night people. At their location, there is a number on the flyers. We start this segment with Martha Reeves, and we're wrapping up with another Motown legend. Gladys, Gladys, Gladys. Oh, so we're going to let you hear the sounds of Gladys Knight when she was here in Buffalo performing with the BPO. So we don't have much to say to you. We want you to just enjoy the music. But we want to thank you for joining us on Community. We'll see you next month. Martha to Gladys. Drop the mic. All right. Y'all don't make me hurt myself.